everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Heather and today I am reviving my channel after that much needed break to fill you in on all of the books that I read in June. I had a really great reading month in June. I was finishing up the school year as a teacher so reading was a much needed escape for me and a wonderful way to begin my vacation. Fair warning, it is supposed to rain very soon, so excuse the dark and humid mess that you see here. I'm trying to squeeze this video in before that storm comes through. So first off, I started with my nonfiction book for the month, which was Best Foot Forward by Adam Hills. I adore Adam Hills as a comedian. If you are not familiar with him, as many people in the US aren't, he is an Australian stand-up comedian who has been doing wonderful things. And I love him because as angry as he gets on certain issues, and rightly so, his comedy is ultimately really positive and seeking to create positive change which I think is something we all need these days. So this was his memoir about his childhood and growing up with an artificial right foot and a desire to get into comedy and how both of those things influenced the way his career and his life turned out. And I really enjoyed this. I wouldn't say that it was a stellar standout memoir but it was really enjoyable and I'm really glad that I have the insight that I do into him as a person now. Then I finished Twice Upon a Time, which was an arc that I received of a book that is going to be a bind up of short stories and unpublished works by L.M. Montgomery. This collection was just okay. I have to say I didn't really enjoy a lot of the stories that were included, especially because there would always be an introduction beforehand telling you that you know, this story was later turned into this episode in the Anne series, say. And so because I could see those parallels so clearly having read the Anne series, the early version just didn't hold up, which I suppose is why L.M. Montgomery reworked them later as well. There were three, however, that I thought were really intriguing. So if you can find either this collection or these stories through another method, I would encourage you to read these three stories. Those are The Indecision of Margaret, Tomorrow Comes, and Retribution. Those three I really enjoyed, but the other dozens of stories in here just didn't really hold up as compared to her finished pieces later. A short story collection that I did love, however, was The Secret Lives of Church Ladies by Disha Filia. This is an incredible collection of stories about Black women in a variety of situations and how the church has influenced their lives, usually in some sort of a negative way in terms of their self-worth or their relationships or their familial relationships. I found every single one of these really powerful. I had such a clear picture of who these people were, which is a real feat considering the short amount of time that Filial had to set up these stories. And I remember almost every single one of them. That is really hard to do for a short story collection, but she did it. So if you're thinking about reading these, I would very definitely recommend them. I then read A Single Thread of Moonlight by Laura Wood, which is a strange late Victorian Cinderella story with a twist. There's a slight revenge plot to it, which is just incredible. So Iris Grey has run away from home. She has faked her own death to escape her stepmother because she is convinced that her stepmother killed 
her father. And so ever since then, she has cultivated a new life for herself in London, far away from her stepmother and stepsisters. Until one day when she is hired by a mysterious man to be his escort to a week at this country house, which is being hosted by her stepmother. It's really gripping, it's fun, there are loads of twists and turns. I loved what they did with the ending, that it wasn't about pure revenge and there were a lot of really positive moments. It wasn't about women competing with each other and putting each other down all the time. There are a lot of really positive interactions that Iris ends up having with the older women there, with her stepsisters. It was really, really enjoyable, as is everything that I have read from Laura Wood so far. Then I read two ebooks. So first, I borrowed The Island of Dr. Moreau from my local library on, as an ebook, and that is by H.G. Wells. And I had heard so much about this for so long, not entirely positive, but it is a pivotal and foundational piece of science fiction. So I went ahead and read it and yeah, I completely agree with those reviews. I did not necessarily enjoy it. I completely see why people look at it as a very racist text. Foundational science fiction and science fiction in general tends to be books that I do not enjoy because they are very unsettling and because they can be quite clunky in a number of ways. If you're unfamiliar though, The Island of Dr. Moreau is about this man who somehow finds himself on this island which is pretty much deserted except for Dr. Moreau and his assistant and they are performing experiments between humans and animals that get progressively creepier and more destructive. And that's really all I can say because it is a very short piece. But the other reason I read it was because I received an ebook arc of The Daughter of Dr. Moreau by Silvia Moreno Garcia. I had read Mexican Gothic. Did I read it last year or the year before? I think I read it the year before. And I enjoyed it, but I found it a bit lacking. I felt like the colonial commentary could have gone a bit further for me. But I was intrigued to see where she took the story of Dr. Moreau. As you may have guessed from the title, this follows Dr. Moreau's daughter. Moreno Garcia invents a daughter for him and sets it all on the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, which I have been to. I conducted linguistic research there in college. So I was really excited to see where this was going to go, but I had to DNF it. The writing was beautiful, but it was very, very boring. It was taking ages to set up. Once again, there was some colonial commentary about how the Mayans were being treated as a native people, as compared to the colonial Spanish and Mexican families. But I felt like it was just lurking in the background, and a third of the way through the book, we hadn't even really touched on his experiments. The man who washes up on the island hasn't even turned up yet, and I just could not push myself to go any further forward. So once again, I think her concept was amazing, but I wish it had been executed differently. One book with an amazingly executed concept, however, was My Policeman by Bethan Roberts. You may have heard a lot about this recently as while I was reading it, the trailer was released for the film starring Harry Styles, among others. And that was the main reason why I read it. I knew that a lot of my students were probably going to watch it, Harry Styles being as wildly popular as he is. And so I wanted to know what it was about and what they were talking about so I could know how to handle certain conversations that might come up. And I'm so glad I did. This was a really, really enjoyable book. It's told from two perspectives. 
first you hear from Marion's perspective, who falls in love. She develops a hopeless crush on her friend's older brother, Tom, who eventually, after a stint in the army, becomes a policeman upon his return, and they decide to get married. However, the second perspective that we hear from is from Patrick, who owns a museum also in Brighton. And he falls in love with Tom as well. And so we keep flipping perspectives both between the two of them and in time. We start in, I think, the 1990s when they're all much older and Patrick has had a stroke and Marion and Tom are caring for him. And Marion is telling him the story of why she did what she did from her perspective to kind of ease her guilt. So it's very much like atonement in that sense. But what I found absolutely fascinating is although you hear from two out of three of the characters, you never hear from Tom, the policeman. You never hear his perspective, which I found really fascinating, if a little bit disappointing, but in a good way. Yeah, I found this really enjoyable, really incredible. It is incredibly sad and really quite tense for a number of different reasons, but I loved it nonetheless, and I highly recommend it. Another LGBTQ book that I ended up reading this month was another ebook borrow from my library, which was His Right Hand by Metty Ivy Harrison. This is book two in a series that I started years ago. I think I read the first one in 2015. And the series is called the Linda Walheim Mystery Series, I think. And it focuses on the LDS or Latter-day Saint, otherwise known as Mormon community in, I think, Provo, Utah, or around Provo, which is in the Salt Lake City area. Provo is the city where Brigham Young University is located. And I love this series for a number of reasons. Firstly, my dear friend Amanda lived in and around Salt Lake City and Provo for years when we were growing up. She went to BYU. So I spent a lot of vacations out in that area of the world. And I truly love Northern Utah. Southern Utah is beautiful as well, but I really loved it. So I love reading these books because I know these people and I know what they look like. I know what the communities feel like, but I also love them because they take a really unflinching look at the LDS community. And I read somewhere that these mysteries kind of poke at the bruises in the LDS community, just to point out, okay, here is where we have a problem, be it a social problem, a theological problem, there is an issue here and we need to deal with it. But that's all she says. She shows both sides of the issue, but she doesn't tell us, and this is how we need to solve it. Which I think, and I hope, if more people read them, could be a really good way to force people to move forward and look at these issues in the future. Because they don't feel like you're being preached at to do one thing or another as a solution. So these stories focus around Linda Walheim, who is the wife of a local bishop. And so through her husband being called in as basically a minister to counsel families when various hardships arise, and then through her work with the community counseling, say, wives and children of those families, she usually ends up solving or at least helping the police to solve whatever mystery has been going on. This one I found doubly fascinating because it looks at the way LGBTQ issues are handled within the LDS community. Now, the Church of Latter-day Saints is extremely conservative, especially when it comes to LGBTQ issues. So there is a fair amount of homophobic thought that is expressed by a wide variety of characters and transphobic thought. So if those are triggering for you, I will put that out there as a warning. 
And indeed, those passages were hard for me to read as well. It's a good way for her to poke at the bruise. But there were also an equal number of characters who had quite positive reactions towards these trans and these gay characters who crop up. And that, I think, balances the scales a bit. And if fairly conservative LDS members are reading these, I'm hoping that those positive reactions could at least make them stop and think about their own reactions. But anyway, into a book summary. So Linda's husband, as the bishop, has two men who are sort of his assistants. There is a technical name for them, but I've forgotten it now. And so they and their wives go out to dinner one night to talk about a variety of questions and things they need to take care of in the coming weeks. And at that meeting, one of the other couples has clearly had a fight before they got there. A husband is extremely rigid in his gender views, such that it makes everyone else uncomfortable. This then aggravates whatever argument he and his wife have been having, and they leave. They storm out of the dinner. So once the dinner has officially wrapped up, Linda's husband says to her, look, I think we should call them, see if we can go over, check in on them, and make sure that they're okay, because something's not right there. We, we need to check in on them. So they do, and they are told, no, 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 everything's fine now, which, of course, feels rather suspicious. In the small hours of the morning, they receive a phone call from, his, from the wife of this couple saying that her husband had gone to the church and he hasn't come home yet and he's not answering his phone, she doesn't know where he is, could you please help? So Linda and her husband get up, they go over to the church and they find that her husband is dead in the office. And if you would not like one major spoiler, please pause the video here and skip ahead a little bit. Or the other major surprise about this man's death is not only how and why was he murdered, but the autopsy reveals that this man was in fact trans. He had started life biologically as a woman and no one knew, including his wife. And this opens a huge can of worms within the community and poses an extra layer of problems for Linda to dig through as she and the police try to figure out who killed this man and why. So as I said, major trigger warnings, but I think ultimately these issues were handled in quite a balanced way, which hopefully will provoke positive change going forward. I then read Sex and Vanity by Kevin Kwan, which I have been meaning to read for ages. Kevin Kwan wrote the Crazy Rich Asians series, which I did read a few years ago. This is completely unrelated. This is a standalone novel. It is very similar in that it takes place within the world of the Asian elite, but it is also a retelling of A Room with a View by E.M. Forrester, which I also love, and I was really intrigued to see how he was going to handle those elements of the text. And I think he did really, really well. You could clearly see a lot of the parallels between the two novels, which I really appreciated. It's clear that he has a deep love of A Room with a View. But it also worked in a number of other issues, especially around being Asian American and the various racial issues and identity issues that that creates both out-and-out -out racism towards Asians in general, as well as being half and half, being half white and half Asian, and struggling with your own identity and thinking, what parts of both cultures do I honor? What parts of it do I not keep? How does the way I look affect how people perceive me as opposed to my brother? It was really fascinating, and at times those sections are deeply uncomfortable, but I am so, so glad that he addressed them nonetheless. And it was also a really fun romp. 
on top of all of that. So yeah, I would highly recommend this book. I then read The White Tiger by Aravind Adiga. No, I have not watched the film yet, but now at least I can. This is the story of Balram, who comes from a very, very poor interior rural Indian town, and he eventually leaves his family, he leaves what they expected him to be, and he goes to the big city and he ends up getting a job as a driver for this very rich family. There are a few more steps in between, but ultimately that's where the story really picks up. And he becomes a driver to this family who are Indian, but they have lived a lot of time in America. So there's the culture clash as well of what this man expects, of what his wife expects of India, versus how it actually is and how the un-Americanized servants see them and how the un-Americanized family members see them. And slowly Balram is drawn into the husband's confidence and he uses that and the power he has as a driver to slowly exact punishment. So it is dark, it is twisted, it is very, very weird psychologically, but it is utterly gripping and fascinating at the same time. So I'm really glad that I read it. Then for something lighter, I borrowed as an ebook More Than Marmalade, which is a children's biography of Michael Bond, who wrote the Paddington books. This was aimed at children, so it was told rather more like a story than the biographies that I'm used to as an adult. But it was still really enjoyable, and I learned a lot about Michael Bond's life that I didn't necessarily know before. And of course it has deepened my love for Paddington. How could it not? So a very enjoyable read, and potentially one to look for if you have young people in your life who also love Paddington. Also in the lighter vein, I read The Siren of Sussex by Mimi Matthews. This is a Victorian historical romance novel. It's part of the Bells of London series. I believe book two is supposed to come out in October. And this was incredible. I hadn't read any Mimi Matthews before, but I heard wonderful things from other people about her. And I adored this book. It was really wonderful. It focuses on Evelyn Maltravers, who is a bit of a blue stocking, honestly, doesn't have many romantic prospects. Her sister, it turns out, has eloped with a man, and so she doesn't hope for a lot from her season. And honestly, she's not really looking for a match. All she wants to do is be respected as a horsewoman. However, she then meets Ahmad Malik ostensibly to make her a riding habit, as he's a tailor, he's a junior tailor. But slowly, a romance begins to form. And I love that not only does it have them have a meeting of the minds as well as asexual chemistry, but you also dive deeply into class issues, gender issues, race issues, that were going on during the Victorian period, and it was really beautiful. I would have loved for it to be a little bit steamier, having come off an E.B. Dunmore binge, but I loved it nonetheless. So if you are someone who doesn't necessarily look for steaminess in your romances, this could be an excellent option for you, and I am very much looking forward to reading book two. I then read Half Sick of Shadows by Laura Sebastian. I did finally read the poem The Lady of Shalott, although I didn't really need to as it didn't make her story any clearer. I still do not entirely understand The Lady of Shalott, and that is a Tennyson poem if you're not familiar. But The Lady of Shalott is a character from the Arthurian legends, and so this frames Elaine, the Lady of Shalott's story, from her perspective, finding out more about her mother, her gift, her time on Avalon, 
and it frames it that Avalon was kind of a training ground for anyone with magical abilities. And that is where Elaine and Lancelot and Arthur and Guinevere spent their time as teenagers to hone their gifts, but it also gave them time to get to know one another and it formed their relationships. But then they must return to Camelot for Arthur to reclaim the throne and that's where things start to go wrong. And Elaine's gift is the gift of prophecy, so she is constantly trying to outrun the future. So you know how it's going to end from the very beginning, if you know Arthurian myth, or indeed if you read the first couple of pages, you know that you cannot outrun the future, which in part is what makes it so tragic but I also love how well it tackles mental illness, how well it tackles feelings of deficiency and not belonging and how different people react to that. The character study was really, really fascinating. I don't know that I would have necessarily framed some of the characters the way that Laura Sebastian did, but she made it utterly believable nonetheless. I'm very picky when it comes to my Arthurian retellings, but I really liked what she did with each of these characters. And yeah, I thought it was really enjoyable and very, very well done. And finally, I needed a book that I could read in a day, so I picked up Ex Libris by Anne Fadiman, which is subtitled Confessions of a Common Reader. This is a book this is a book that I picked up with Marissa from Blatantly Bookish back in April, and she highly recommended it and said it's basically a love letter to books and reading and anyone who is also a huge bookworm will really identify with this book, and that is exactly the case. These are a bunch of essays that Anne Fadiman wrote about books and reading, either her experiences growing up, her experiences meeting her husband who is also a major book nerd, and their struggles together to merge their two book-loving personalities, what it's like for them as parents raising their own children to love books. I really, really enjoyed this. I don't necessarily agree with some of her views about books. Honestly, she would think I was quite prissy about my books, especially the physical condition in which I keep them, but I don't care. I'm going to keep doing what I love doing and she can keep battering her books to shreds as well and we can both be very happy doing that. So, I would say if you are here watching booktube and you haven't read Ex Libris, definitely do it. It's very quick, very short, but really enjoyable. And of course, I am reading The Count of Monte Cristo. I started it at the beginning of the month. By this point, which is mid-July, I am two-thirds of the way through it. And that is for Naomi of Naomi's Bookshelves, readathon for it. So we should be done with it by mid-August, I believe. And I'm enjoying it. It's good. It hasn't become the life-changing read that some people have told me it will. But we shall see. There could be plot points yet to happen that could change my mind. But I am still glad that I am reading it. And I am finding it interesting that every time he starts to do a Victor Hugo-esque tangent and bring in new characters or talk about this new place or have a new character tell this story about 20 years ago and you start thinking, okay, Alexandre, where are we going with this? Can, can we wrap this up today? As soon as you start feeling that way, he will circle it back and connect it to one of our main characters or main plot points and you will think, oh, okay, all is forgiven. There was actually a point to that digression. I, I'm sorry, continue. So in my monthly wrap ups, I will continue let, to let you know how far along I am with that book. And yeah, stay tuned to know my final thoughts. 
So there you have it. Those are all the books that I read in June. Let me know down below if you have also read these books and what you thought of them, or if you have any further questions for me, or if you have recommendations for me based on what I told you about these books. I would be thrilled to know any or all information that you have, and until next time, be safe, be well, and happy reading. Bye everyone.